Welcome back. Please excuse our short delay. That was due to some technical challenges that we now have. But it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our final guest of this year's late summer school. Dr. Felipe Terran is from Philadelphia, USA, and he completed his residency at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. He now works as a clinical instructor in the Division of Emergency Ultrasound in Philadelphia, local time, 6 p.m. This is why he got up very early to be with us here today. I think already that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> His field of work includes critical care ultrasound, TEE, emergency critical care, and resuscitation. Today, he will introduce us to ultrasound in the field of cardiac arrest. It's an honor to have such an expert in critical care and emergency ultrasound with us here today. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Felipe Terran. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Thank you, David. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone in the team for this incredible opportunity. I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Simon? Can you hear me, Simon? Yes, we uh, can hear you. We can hear you in the audience. Okay, great. Okay, that's all matters. David, is it everything okay in your side? Absolutely. We can hear you and we can see you. Okay, fantastic. So, thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Um, it is an honor to be here participating from uh, remotely from uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in the United States. I would have loved to be there in person. Um, I, I truly enjoyed being there last year, but I couldn't uh, be there in person this year, unfortunately. So um, I didn't want to miss the opportunity and I wanted to um, live stream this, this uh, brief talk for you on uh, the role of ultrasound um, to enhance cardiac arrest resuscitation. So I'm currently an emergency physician working clinically and combining my work with uh, some research in the field of uh, ultrasound in cardiac arrest. I'm specifically interested in trying to understand better cardiac arrest physiology and ideally develop therapies and interventions such as the use of ultrasound that can help us ultimately, ideally, to improve cardiac arrest outcomes. So to dive right into it, there's over 390,000 cardiac arrests every year. And what's important to remember uh, from that number is that from those patients, only one out of five actually survive hospital discharge. That means that over 368,000 patients a year actually um, end up dying from cardiac arrest. So it's a major um, healthcare problem, and therefore, uh, why it's important to do research um, and to advance the science on this field. So, to summarize the approach of cardiac arrest, we can say that um, cardiac arrest is defined as a patient who is unresponsive with no palpable central pulse. And the next question, when we have, when we know that, is what is the patient's rhythm? The options is at essentially um, four. The patient might have a triple fibrillation or, or pulses ventricular tachycardia, which is essentially a non-perfusing arrhythmia, or the patient might have pulses electrical activity. What that means is essentially an organized cardiac, a, a, an organized cardiac rhythm on the monitor that should um, generate a pulse, but not, but is not generating a pulse. Finally, a systole is essentially a flat line, meaning the heart is actually not doing nothing mechanically or uh, from an electrical standpoint. What's important to remember is that we, we know how to treat ventricular fibrillation uh, very well. Um, for over 20 uh, years, we've uh, centered our efforts on uh, improving the care for patients with shock of rhythms. And that's because those are the patients that have highest survival, um, have a high, highest rates of survival and, and, bet, and best neuro, neurological outcomes. So there's been a lot of um, um, 
progress made on improving the survival of these patients, getting early defibrillation, um, having availability of uh, automatic defibrillators everywhere. Um, and, um, and that is uh, certainly uh, what explains that, that we've uh, made a significant progress in the uh, rates of survival and neurologically intact recovery after shock rhythms in cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, unfortunately, PA is not the same case. PA, to be quite honest, at this point, we still don't really know how to treat. We essentially have no effective specific therapy to treat patients with PA. What's even more um, important to remember is that over the past 20 or 30 years, um, we have seen a significant decrease in the rates of ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia as presenting rhythms of all comments with cardiac arrest. So readily, the patient, the, the group of patients with PA and asystole are becoming a more important group of patients um, in the overall number of patients with cardiac arrest that we see. So that is important because, as I, as I mentioned, PA is really an old and poorly defined syndrome. We're essentially putting under this category of pulses electrical activity is probably a number of different patients with different pathophysiology and that could potentially benefit from different types of therapy. And the only reason why we call them all PA is because number one, we haven't really been able to differentiate them uh, in those different categories because we haven't really had um, a good tool to do that. And number two, because we don't really have specific therapies um, if we um, were to uh, divide these patients in different categories. Right now, all we do for these patients is essentially ensure that we provide high quality CPR, um, that, we shock, that, we, that we check for rhythms every two minutes and, and look for a shock of a rhythm and give epinephrine. Besides that, we're only trying to identify reversible causes um, that can uh, eventually allow us to get ROSC. So in summary, PA in 2018 remains a black box. As an example of that, from the perspective, from the perspective of ultrasound and point of care ultrasound uh, being incorporated in the assessment of these patients, you can see that a patient with this rhythm in this echocardiogram would be called PA. Same rhythm, but then this echocardiogram would also call PA. The patient does not have a bottom pulse. Finally, this patient is an image from TE. If the patient has the same electrocardiographic rhythm, this patient is also called PEA. So, and finally, this patient, which you could argue this is actually cardiac standstill, but there's some minimal cardiac activity. So, what's clear is that, as I mentioned, un until this point, we haven't really been able to understand perfectly this enemy of PEA. The use of ultrasound the use of point of care ultrasound in cardiac arrest provides us with a unique opportunity to better identify those patients and to do the best thing we can do to identify those reversible etiologies and ensure that we're providing high quality of CPR to provide the maximum and the best opportunities of getting ROS. So how do we do that? How do we identify those reversible causes using ultrasound during cardiac arrest. We are supposed to remember and run to, through this HSMTs while we're running a code um, in a cardiac arrest. So as you can see some of this, we can actually identify and diagnose with the use of ultrasound. So we can divide the use of the applications of point of care ultrasound in cardiac arrest in three categories. It can help us assist diagnosis. It can help us identify who is actually in cardiac arrest. It can help us identify and define prognosis for those patients. And finally, and this is personally, I believe, one of the most promising applications, it can enhance the quality of our chest compressions. So let's start by assessing, by, by uh, analyzing how can ultrasound and particularly echocardiography help us assist diagnosis. It can help us identify the patient that the patient is actually in cardiac arrest. It can further help us assess the presence or absence of cardiac output, and it can help us identify 
the reversible ideologies that we can treat to get ROMs. As I mentioned before, cardiac arrest is essentially defined as a, the absence of a central palpable pulse. Unfortunately, there are several studies that have shown that both the sensitivity and the specificity of our finger being used to identify a central pulse is essentially not very good. The sensitivity reported in some of the studies is around 86%, and the specificity is even worse, under 60% in certain cases. What this means is when you put providers that have been trained in, um, in advanced cardiac life support and you ask them to identify uh, whether a patient has or does not have a pulse, they won't agree uh, in almost half of the time. I don't know if um, how the patients that you, um, uh, that you see in your clinical environment, but unfortunately, many of the patients that I see in my clinical environment look like this one. And it was a patient that looked like this one uh, that I got called for one day working in the emergency department not that long ago. So uh, I, he I hear the uh, activation of uh, rapid response for cardiac arrest of a patient that was going through uh, a CAT scan in radiology. When I arrived, there were multiple people in the room, just like here, trying to detect a pulse, while others were trying to connect this patient to the monitor. There was a lot of chaos, um, and it, it was probably a few minutes um, uh, that of, of this going on before um, I arrived there. As I usually do, when I heard the activation, I grabbed my ultrasound machine um, and run with it. And as, I soon, as, as soon as I got there, I put the probe on the chest, and this is what I saw. So when I saw this, I looked around and wondered, what are we doing trying to identify a pulse in this patient? With this image of ultrasound, it becomes very clear that this patient is obviously in cardiac arrest, and we need to start chest compressions immediately. Here's another example. This was a 45-year-old male that was brought to us by EMS with ongoing chest compressions. We were told that he had um, a systole in the rhythm in, uh, in the field. The rhythm strip uh, looked like this one. In the absence of a palpable pulse, you would say, well, this is um, obviously PEA, right? But yet, when we put the probe in the chest at arrival um, during the assessment of this patient, this is what we saw. This is a person no longer access view of uh, not great quality, but it's enough quality that you can identify what the myocard, what the, what the my ventricular wall is doing. So I'm having a small problem here. All right, we're back. So as soon as we put the probe on the chest, what we saw in this case was this. So as you can see here, there's fine ventricular fibrillation. This heart was not actually in PEA, but rather in ventricular fibrillation, yet we couldn't just identify that on the monitor. This patient was shock and got ROS. On the other hand, with the use of point of ultrasound, we can enhance the specificity of our um, diagnosis of cardiac arrest. How many times you think that EMS in the field, uh, appropriately so, has initiated chest compressions on a patient that actually didn't require them? Some patients are considered to be in cardiac arrest when a pulse is not palpable, and that is the right thing to do. But when that happens, we automatically activate this cardiac arrest algorithm, the pathway. We start doing compressions. Some of those patients we have learned are not actually in cardiac arrest. This is a patient that presented to us, um, brought uh, with only chest compressions on the monitor, had organized electric activity with very low voltage due to obesity. On my first look with ultrasound, the patient had, um, as the patient had been, was being connected to the monitor, this is uh, what I saw. So this patient had an organized um, Activity just had a very, very uh, thready pulse uh, that was not really uh, detectable uh, with your finger. Yet, as soon as we put an A line on this patient, 
and this was the, mon the monitor uh, or the type of rhythm that we're seeing the monitor, as soon as we place the intra, um, uh, the uh, arterial line, the uh, pressure that we got was 65 over 40. So immediately we understood that this patient was actually in cardiogenic shock and had a history of cardiac disease that, that, that made sense for this uh, to be cardiogenic shock. Um, and uh, got, soon after that, uh, got a little bit more information um, and, and, and learned from the family that actually this patient had been um, overdosed in calcium channel blockers and had been also doing a lot of cocaine lately that explained the rhythm that we're seeing and um, the, the, the image on the ultrasound. You might think that I'm showing you a zebra, that this is really not uncommon, but this is another case. This was a patient in whose, on whom uh, we couldn't palpate a pulse during the initial uh, assessment. Um, also with organized uh, cardiac activity on ultrasound, on, on the monitor, which uh, appeared uh, on uh, the uh, EKG then to have a second degree AV block, had a severe, uh, what we thought is cardiogenic shock with an EF probably 10% in this case. So this patient actually needed pressor support. Uh, it needed search for uh, an underlying cost. Didn't need actually a one milligram dose of epinephrine and uh, chest compressions. So this, um, is the perfect moment to introduce uh, something that I mentioned briefly, that is uh, pseudo-PEA. So pseudo-PEA is uh, the fraction of patients that um, are classified as PEA, but yet when we look with ultrasound, they actually have cardiac activity. From those patients that we say that have PEA, we've found from several studies that over 50% of those cases actually have cardiac activity. And you have to remember this PA concept is simply a definition that involves two things, it involves the absence of a pulse and electrocardiographic rhythm. There's no mention on what the heart is actually doing, but this is pretty important. When we have ultrasound available, we can identify those patients and we see that actually over half of those patients are not true PA, but yet uh, pseudo PA and that's defined as a patient that has a no palpable pulse, but yet when we look with ultrasound, has um, a cardiac activity that's actually generating um, some perfusion. So our team's hypothesis, our current understanding of this, is that PEA is actually a spectrum of disease that begins with cardiogenic shock and that ends with the inference is that because we've only had opportunity to get snapshots just limited windows, um, if any, uh, of the heart, we were able in different cases to see the heart at different points in this uh, spectrum. We believe that this spectrum uh, can and should be treated differently depending on where the patient is. Of course, you might say, well, but we don't know yet how to treat them differently. There's some data that suggests that patients that have pseudo-PA that are treated with continuous infusion of pressors instead of CPR might do better. That's, that's very preliminary data and not definitive, but that makes some sense because that is how we treat patients with cardiogenic shock. On the other hand, probably makes sense to do compressions in patients that have a cyst. And so um, the research, and the, the reason why I wanted to share this with you is because ultrasound represents a unique tool that might allow us to better understand the physiology and the physiopathology of, uh, of PEA uh, in um, shock and cardiac arrests. You might say, well, but why not just to err on the side of doing CPR? And that's actually a good assumption. It's the reason why many of us simply do CPR in all these patients. The reason to consider maybe not doing CPR in some of these patients, at least from a science standpoint, is that there's some data from uh, one of our uh, collaborators, Dr. Norman Parties, that says that essentially when we do compressions with standard CPR, we're not synchronizing the compressions to that native remaining cardiac activity of the heart. And therefore, we have 50% chances that we hit that ventricle during diastolic feeling, and that will lead to worse uh, cardiac output, if any. So his work group has been working on developing a uh, prototype of mechanical CPR device that will actually synchronize the compression to the electrical cardiographic uh, rhythm, therefore providing 
compressions only ancestrally. So we covered the uh, role of ultrasound helping uh, assess, identify, di uh, diagnose uh, the cardiac arrest, identify cardiac arrest, identify the actual rhythm uh, that we have, identify whether there is true arrest, uh, true PA or pseudo PA. And finally, and this is probably the most common element that the, the, the most, um, the element that you're most familiar with is the use of ultrasound to identify reversible etiologies. And from those, the most common uh, and probably easiest to understand is the presence of cardiac tamponade, obstructive shock in a patient um, with PA, uh, that during the rhythm check, for instance, just like this one is found to have a large pericardial effusion. The treatment of this obviously needs to be drainage and emerging pericardial synthesis, put a needle in that uh, chest and drain the fluid. Until we do that, the patient will not get ROS. It doesn't make sense uh, to continue standard C standard ACLS. We need to intervene at that cost. There's no other reason, as, no other way, as far as I'm uh, uh, aware, to identify and diagnose uh, pericardial tamponade without having point of care ultrasound. Tension pneumothorax, it's another common uh, um, and important reversible cause to remember. You uh, saw in some of the lectures before the use of ultrasound and specifically long ultrasound to assess the pleura, the sign called pleural sliding is essentially telling us that the uh, pleura is intact and that there's no pneumothorax. When there's no sliding, we know that that, uh, in some cases, um, corresponds with tension pneumothorax, and that's how it should be interpreted in the context of a patient in cardiac arrest. There's no better way to diagnose attention in thorax during cardiac arrest than using point of care ultrasound. Finally, patients that have not just uh, PA, but instead fine ventricular fibrillation. We've had several of these patients that we identified with ultrasound, and we just decided to do uh, defibrillation in patients uh, like this one got lost. Cardiogenic shock, as I mentioned before, patients that actually initially we thought had cardiac arrest, that had a PA, but yet in a, in a, uh, during our assessment, we really understood uh, quickly that what they really had was cardiogenic shock and they, need, they needed pressure support and not uh, chest impressions. Cardiac, uh, the use of uh, point of care ultrasound and echo can also help us identify patients with bad with poor prognosis, and patients also with better prognosis. So it can help us define, in some general terms, obviously not as an isolated element, but it can provide some data to us to help us identify the prognosis. There is a landmark paper published over uh, almost 20 years ago uh, here in the United States that essentially showed us that patients presenting to the emergency department, in that case was over 100 patients, that had cardiac standstill, so no motion of the ventricles during the assessment of the initial echocardiogram, those patients had 0% survival, regardless of whether it was PA or a sexual. So no, the, none of those patients survived um, to hospital discharge. That number has slightly been questioned and changed after a much larger and better quality study, the, the recent uh, study, the largest um, uh, study conducted to date in cardiac arrest that enrolled over 20 hospitals in the United States and Canada. And this study um, enrolled uh, over 793 patients and the survival rates that they found was that uh, the uh, demonstrated that there was a significant difference in those between those patients that had cardiac activity uh, on ultrasound in the initial assessment and those that didn't. As you can see in this uh, in this graph, uh, the patients with cardiac activity demonstrated a higher ROSC, 51% uh, versus 14%, and survival to hospital admission, 29% versus 7.2%, uh, and also survival to hospital discharge. 3.8% for those patients with cardiac activity and 0.6%. Uh, this means three patients in this study, three patients that had no cardiac activity on the initial ultrasound, but yet made it to hospital discharge. So this study and the data produced from uh, these investigators came to um, question that assumption, the general assumption that we had from prior data stating that every patient coming in with cardiac standstill has no chance of surviving to hospital discharge. 
Uh, we're not going to get into the weeds of discussing the, the nuances of that, but you uh, should have in mind that ultrasound has the ability to identify uh, these patients. So in general, we could say that uh, pornoke ultrasound can help us uh, identifying the uh, prognosis and probably most accurately identifying the patients in whom a prolonged resuscitation might not actually provide benefits, specifically asystolic patients without cardiac activity on ultrasound. We should consider, obviously, with uh, in concert with other clinical information, we should consider discontinuing the resuscitation in some of those patients. Finally, and this is what I believe personally is the most exciting and promising application of point of cure ultrasound, is that we can enhance the quality of chest compressions using CPR. So see, what you need to remember is that during cardiac arrest, there is essentially three phases. Downtime where the patient has no flow. There's no flow because the, the, uh, the heart is not beating and we're not doing anything to move uh, blood um, in that patient's uh, circulation. Then when we get to the scene, we start doing high quality CPR, hopefully. But even if we're providing high quality CPR, we're really only providing 20 to 30% cardiac output of the normal cardiac output. And it's only when we get ROSC and we uh, start post-resuscitation measures that we actually achieve normal flow. So it's important to remember that even when we're providing high quality CPR, we're really not providing um, a, a very meaningful uh, cardiac output. And this is in part one of the reasons why um, development, the development of uh, strategies like the use of extracorporeal circulation has gained a lot of traction um, in certain uh, group of patients. With the current, um, with our current understanding of CPR physiology, the effect of CPR, according to what's called the cardiac pump theory, is due to direct compression of the left ventricle between the sternum and the spine. Therefore, positioning of the hands or the compression uh, device is critically to actually generate uh, appropriate systemic flows. There is plenty of data demonstrating that the landmark uh, recommendation of performing chest compressions at the internipple line doesn't not really fit all, doesn't really help all patients. Unfortunately, we know from many of the studies that in over 40% of the cases, when we provide compressions in that side, we're actually compressing the left ventricle alpha tract. And in nearly 20% of the cases, we are actually compressing, we're extracting the aortic root. This is an example of uh, an attempt to use point of care echo, transthoracic echo in a five chamber, uh, in a, in a four, uh, apical four chamber window to assess the left ventricle. You can uh, barely see the left ventricle. It's difficult to interpret whether we're actually compressing it because of the position of the beam in this window in transthoracic. This is another attempt to make the assessment using uh, transthoracic echo, in this case, using a, sun, a subsiphoid approach. You can see the heart, but it's hard to interpret what's actually happening in terms of compression. This is another example of the same thing. Many people have tried over the last few years to use images like this to guide the quality of resuscitation. And the truth is that in that kind of image is actually when images look relatively good. There's many images people won't show you on lectures because we select the ones that look nice. But many of the patients that I've seen have uh, the best image that I've been able to obtain during the cardiac arrest looks more like this one or more like this one or more like this one. So in those cases, unfortunately, we are left with a black box. We can't make decisions. We can't... Um, uh, do proper decision making if we don't have that data. It's not the right standard of care. And it's because of that um, that I believe strongly that the future of cardiac arrest ultrasound and the future of cardiac arrest imaging is the use of resuscitated T. I'm sure some of you have seen uh, some of the papers that exist, some of the literature um, that has uh, described this in our group certainly doing that and uh, working on advancing research on this field, but it makes absolutely the most sense. T, unlike transthoracic echo, has a unique position in the esophagus that it's close 
to the left atrium and provides a beam that is generated from behind the heart. Therefore, it has nothing uh, to interfere with uh, the, the chest and we don't uh, interfere with anything that is happening on the chest of the patient, unlike what we're trying to perform a transthoracic. Even furthermore, we obtain high quality uh, images because of the proximity, because of how close the probe gets uh, to uh, from the heart, that uh, the quality of the images and the high frequency of that probe, higher frequency compared to the probes that we use in transthoracic, provide this beautiful, sharp, uh, clear images that remain uh, there in our screen even throughout the entire resuscitation. So intra-REST-T provides continuous uh, and real-time window to CPR. So we don't have to just restrict ourselves to assessing what's going on with the heart with, uh, during those rhythm checks, but also we can assess throughout the entire resuscitation. This is an example of a patient with uh, T in place and this is a window that you might not be familiar with um, if you haven't seen many TEs, but if you have seen uh, transthoracic echoes, which I know that you have, you will recognize this view. And it's essentially a partial and a long axis view, but it's flipped to the same structure. So what we have there, um, right in the middle field, is the, um, the aortic uh, root, the aortic valve, that is being compressed, being absolutely obliterated uh, during uh, chest compressions in that patient. That, as I said before, we know that is happening in nearly uh, in near 40, uh, 40 to fifty percent of the cases. That patient had the area of maximal compression. The site where we're providing the chest compressions we moved uh, slightly further down and towards the left, so towards the apex, um, and that improved significantly the hemodynamics, um, the anti-vital CO2, the the diastolic blood pressures, and and that patient soon after that uh, achieved ROS. We have had countless of cases now with uh, an experience of uh, over um, 60 cases in my current institution where uh, we've seen this uh, in, again, uh, more than 50% uh, of the cases simply were compressing uh, in the wrong place. This is a transgastric image. We'll be seeing the left ventricle. The left ventricle is essentially not being compressed at all in this case. This is another example of we're compressing the aortic root um, and this is the same example having optimized the air of maximal compression. This is an example of a patient with ongoing CPR with a Lucas mechanical CPR device. You can see the bubbles going in uh, from the epinephrine being administered uh, at that time on the, on the right side, which is the left side of the screen. And that's the same patient uh, receiving uh, chest compressions. Look at the quality of the image. Look at the definition. You can see the valves. You can see perfectly all those leaflets we can assess the competency of those valves with the color. We can actually assess the direction of the flow. So imagine uh, the possibilities that we have with images of this nature uh, in patients in cardiac arrest. This is that uh, an example of a patient uh, with uh, doing a pulse check uh, that we couldn't palpate a good pulse, but this is the image that we get uh, into. We immediately knew that the patient actually obviously had ROSC. This is another example of a patient with ongoing CPR. Uh, we're seeing <clears throat> bubbles also from an infusion going on the right side. Again, much better quality of images. This is a patient that we thought had PEA, but yet as soon as we put the probe uh, in, this is what we saw in the T. We found this patient actually had what looked more uh, like, again, cardiogenic shock. So, T is changing our game today. It's changing management every day in our cardiac arrest patients. It's helping us identify diagnosis just like transthoracic. is an example of a patient with a large obstructive thrombus. That shouldn't be there. You don't have to know much of T to understand that that, that uh, ball that looks like a tennis ball is lodged right on the right atrium. In that thrombus, was causing P in this patient via uh, obstructive shock, that empty right ventricle is essentially not allowing any cardiac output going into the left side. There's another example of patient with aortic dissection. Aortic dissection is extremely difficult to diagnose with transthoracic because we don't really have a good image of the uh, thoracic aorta. Uh, fortunately, with a T, we can identify uh, flaps of dissection like this and make diagnosis fairly easily. Um, as I mentioned before, 
presence of fine atrial fibrillation is another diagnosis that becomes even more easier uh, with a T due to the uh, higher definition of these images. This is an example of a patient that was during the rhythm check thought to be in PA, but yet had fine atrial fibrillation. And if you look carefully here, you can actually see the shock that is delivered immediately right away. Uh, we were ready to, we had the fibrillator loaded as we do uh, charge, as we do in every rhythm check. This is a patient that had uh, a displaced pacemaker lead that had uh, gone all the way into the septum and had <clears throat> uh, was probably irritating the ventricle and we thought it was the culprit of the refractory ventricular fibrillation of that patient. So a mechanical cause that we identify with T. T can also assess, help us assess the effectiveness of our interventions. This is the same patient that I just showed you before with this ongoing continuous window that T provides, we can assess, we were able to assess that, um, that in the effectiveness of uh, the thrombolytic, in this case, TPA, being uh, given into our rest to that patient. And that tennis ball is now uh, basically dissolved and the patient eventually uh, got lost. That is the same patient with, um, with fragments of uh, what was a much larger clot before uh, having resolve the obstructive shock physiology. One uh, <clears throat> image that I wanted to share with you is uh, this one that um, is <clears throat> nearly to show you how uh, soon after we finish with the diagnostic assessment with T, we can simply hang the probe and without need of having anyone actually operating, the T image becomes an additional monitor uh, that essentially is available to everyone in the resuscitation team to uh, follow and to interpret. So to wrap it up, the use of point of care ultrasound in cardiac arrest can help us assist diagnosis. It can help us define prognosis and identify those patients that have better chances of survival that should be aggressively resuscitated and also to identify those patients in whom we should probably consider stopping the resuscitation. Finally, ultrasound, and specifically transesophageal echo, can help us enhance the quality of the chest impressions. With that, I want to summarize the things that I want you to remember the next time that you are in a cardiac arrest and that you have the possibility of using ultrasound. I want you to rule out the presence of cardiac tamponade. I want you to identify the presence of pseudo-PA I want you to identify the patients that have fine ventricular fibrillation and defibrillate those patients. And I want you to identify those patients that had PDA because they are intention And finally, long you have access to transesophageal echo, you should and you could enhance significantly the quality of your chest impressions in your patients with cardiac arrest. If you're interested in learning more, Visit resuscitatedt.com. It's a website with a ton of useful information and resources and links for education um, and phone content around the practice of resuscitated T. And with that, I thank you for your attention. This is my Twitter handle. I'm happy always to engage in any discussions and conversations. That's the resuscitated T projects. Twitter handle, make sure you follow them as well. That is my email. I'm always happy to get emails uh, if you have any question um, around anything on this topic or anything uh, they want to talk about. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taran, for your very informative speech and for sharing your valuable insights. Also, once again, thank you for your trouble. Thank you for getting up so early on a Sunday morning for us. I would just like to take this opportunity to ask anyone in the audience if you have got any questions for Dr. Taran. Yes, you do. Hey, sir. Um, do you know by how many percent you lower the blood flow if you compress, uh, like right on the aortic, uh, on the aortic root? Um, I don't know a percent, actually. Um, we don't have much data on this. We, there's only uh, there's currently two studies out of uh, the same group investigator 
uh, Kenton Anderson out of Stanford, uh, one uh, in a medical cardiac arrest and one in a traumatic model of cardiac arrest an exsanguination protocol that was recently published. Those two papers essentially, uh, what they did is they randomized swine to uh, receive both ch chest compressions uh, over the left ventricle and chest compressions uh, over the uh, aortic root and the LVOT. And uh, what they thought, what they found was that the pigs in the group that was receiving chest compressions over the um, aortic root uh, did not get ROSC. So no pigs in the group that got randomized to, uh, to receiving compressions over the aortic root essentially got ROSC. So that, um, there, the, the numbers that they also got in the data uh, show that there was significant differences between the corner perfusion pressures between those two groups. Um, and, and other uh, hemodynamic parameters, including aortic pressures and entitled CO2. So we are currently working on establishing um, uh, some, uh, some more uh, details on that and working on, on further understanding the, the physiology and what are the uh, implications of uh, providing compressions in the, in the, in the wrong uh, spot. Um, but, but I don't have a percentage. What I can tell you is that what we've seen in our experience, and it's the same experience in many other groups that are doing this, is that in many cases, you can see a clear change, uh, and I'm talking now in patients, you can see a clear change in your uh, diastolic blood pressure, and you can see a clear change in your entitled CO2. Uh, um, and we just last week had a case that um, not only that happened, but the patient actually started to gain consciousness uh, with uh, as soon as we optimized the compression side. So the patient started to um, exhibit what, what is called CPR-dependent consciousness, which is essentially the patient, the patient getting such good perfusion to the brain that it's, that it's waking up intermittently while we're compressing. And when we would pause for a rhythm check, the patient would become unresponsive again. So that was in that case, the indication to put that patient on uh, extracorporeal circulation to initiate ECLS. Um, and that was, I believe, a direct um, consequence of having uh, improved and optimized the compression uh, of uh, the area of maximal compression. Okay, I see. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I, I got a second one. Okay. Um, is there any record on the, the T uh, interfering with breathing devices? I'm not aware of um, any. It's a very interesting question. And, uh, and there's, there's certainly a lot of opportunity to conduct research around that. What, is, uh, what are the implications of having an esophageal uh, probe um, while we're doing compressions? We know that mechanically it doesn't seem to, uh, it doesn't cause any injuries. We haven't yet uh, seen or uh, reported any injuries. Um, uh, and we haven't had any malfunction or any uh, defects on, on the probe, on the equipment from, from using it. Uh, but you raise a good point. We don't know exactly if there, if there might be um, any, uh, any any impact on on the ventilation. But it's all um, stuff that that should be appropriately um, addressing. And there's again opportunity for research around that as well. Thank you so much. Are there more questions? Hello. Um, you mentioned the problems of um, the resuscitation and the point um, where you put the maximum pressure on while you resuscitate, and it's rather easy or um, yeah, maybe possible to optimize it while doing the TEE ultrasound. And um, do you have any like recommendations, or are there new recommendations um, of the um, CPR while you're on the street or the amateur CPR to um, yeah, optimize where you put the pressure on while doing the CPR? In the absence of, of having TE guidance, you mean? Exactly, yeah. Yes, um, so that's a very good question. Thank you. It, it's, it's important to make clear that uh, we are sort of, we're, we're pushing uh, the, uh, the edge here. We, uh, the current algorithm, the current guidelines um, establish that you should do compressions the same way in all patients, right? You should, you should compress. Uh, the mid sternum and the intranipal line is a, a landmark. And uh, everything I discussed today is essentially uh, stuff that has some evidence, uh, but altogether, the evidence behind the use of point of care ultrasound, including the use of TE, um, has not been considered enough of high quality evidence uh, 
um, to made it into the guidelines and the 2015 guidelines uh, actually did not recommend essentially against or in favor of the use of uh, ultrasound during cardiac arrest um, and we have a very sort of lukewarm recommendation of essentially providers can use point of view ultrasound if ultrasound is available and there's someone with expertise and with experience to do it as long as it does not interfere with resuscitation. So uh, it's important to make clear that this is um, something that where we're stepping out of the guidelines and that is fine if you have experience, if you're an expert uh, and you have a good reason um, and you have an institution protocol like we do, um, it makes sense. But it's important to, uh, to, to highlight the fact that we, we are basically stepping beyond uh, what ACLS recommends. Uh, we hope that the research that we are working on, that we're producing, will contribute, as long, along with many others that are working on this around the world, will contribute to uh, hopefully making this part of the new recommendations um, and the new guidelines. But as of today, um, there is uh, different studies that have looked at uh, different positioning in the absence of uh, TE guidance, uh, either just trying different hand positions uh, or trying to guide uh, the the compression quality, for instance, by entitled CO2 um, through ESA from, from um, uh, uh, um, Sweden has done some work on the use of entitled CO2 to guide resuscitation uh, by, by guiding the, air of the, the, the compression site. Um, none of those studies have panned out, have worked as, as we would have liked. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any, uh, any uh, good studies providing uh, an effective method to guide uh, the quality of the chest compressions externally um, with a non-invasive uh, mod or device. Um, I think that might be the future. We need to do more research, but as of today, um, I think if you are running a resuscitation and you've done what you think is high quality CPR, and with that CPR, you're not generating high, uh, you're not generating a good uh, diastolic pressure, so you're, you're not generating good entitled CO2. If you are doing what the guidelines say and you're not generating um, a good quality of uh, perfusion, then then you will never get ROSC. And so I think in those cases, it makes sense, um, and, I, and I personally do this, to step out of the guidelines and, for instance, try moving your hands towards the apex if you suspect that a patient might benefit from that. Interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Taryn. I think you can see me over there. So are there any more questions? If not, then I would like to say thank you once again and many greetings from Graz to Philadelphia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you maybe next year. it for the lectures. We heard nine in total over the course of the last four days and I think all of them have been so interesting each in their own way. But now it's time to say goodbye for the live stream and to all the viewers watching by live stream, especially to all those students that tuned in from our partner universities. I'm going to read them out loud because otherwise I'm going to forget one of them. <laughs> it's been Aachen, Berlin, Bonn, Hamburg. Shout out to one of our colleagues um, Gunther, who's there at the moment. It's also been Mannheim, Innsbruck and Zurich. Thank you so much for your time and we hope that you enjoyed them as much as we did.